So this panel is uh, implementing AI. I know this is a hot topic on every enterprise leader's mind. So we have an excellent panel composed of uh, academics and uh, industrial leaders going to share the war stories and insights uh, from their own experiences. Uh, so it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce the moderator, Michael Schrag, and the panelist. Uh, Michael is a research fellow at the MIT Sloan School's uh, Center for Digital Business. He initiative on Digital Economy, that's the old bio. That's right, okay. In initiative on Digital IDE, Initiative on the Digital Economy. And, and he is, uh, he is also a columnist for the Fortune Magazine, CIO, uh, CIO Magazine, MIT, M Technology Reviews. Let's, let's kill that one, that's a bio from 10 years from ago. From 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> In interesting. Still, still on your website, by the way. So just, uh, just, well, not my website. Okay. <laughs> So, and briefly mention so let's introduce them. the panelists, yes. right? Okay. So, <laughs> David Gledhill on on the far right, on the far, far right, he is the group CIO and head of group technology and operations at the DBS Bank. Cynthia uh, on, the, on the left, Cynthia Storard, uh, senior vice president and chief information information officer at Adobe, and in the middle, Yorgos Zakari, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, <laughs> he is the CTO at Kaya. So please welcome the moderator and the panelist. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Uh, just to reinforce the message that you've been getting, uh, we, we will be taking questions from Slido throughout, so don't hesitate in that regard. Um, this is a terrific panel. It's a terrific group of people. I've really enjoyed my interactions with them. And the way I'd like to set this up is as follows. <clears throat> I'm going to make a couple of quick remarks. Then we're going to do a circuit of three quick questions for context. And then it's going to be, as we've seen in the, the most effective panels, a conversation and interaction, not a, not a presentation. The one thing that I found really striking, you know, when I look at what Google is doing, when I look at Amazon and Microsoft and IBM and GitHub, are doing in the AI and ML space, I am gobsmacked. I am really, really impressed. There is more capability at less cost in the AI, technically, in the AI machine learning space than, than I could have imagined when I was doing expert system stuff here at an, and in Champaign. Um, but at the same time, I can't help but recall a conversation I had at the Cambridge Innovation Center a few months ago with a, an older biostatistician who had worked you know, with the uh, pharma companies, and he was giving a talk on statistics, data science, machine learning. And he sort of said with what I interpreted as a condescending sneer, um, boy, a lot of these ML people, you know, they think they understand statistics and inference and optimization. They, 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 they really don't. They really don't. I, I think we're going to see a lot of big messes in the machine learning space. And, and this is a guy who is making a very, very, very good living as a rebranded machine learning AI consultant. You know, so, so there was a reason why he was saying what he was saying. And I think I want to pursue with some of the people here, all of the people here, you, whether, whether what that trade-off is, what that tension is between this remarkable capability, scalable global capability, and its deployment, and the risks associated with uh, overfitting and trying to optimize things that, in fact, end up making things worse. So three quick questions, conversation. Don't hesitate to send questions based on the responses. We're going to go from David in. First thing, and David, of course, was the CIO of the year winner last year, and you saw him in the panel this morning. What's the most important thing you want this audience to understand about your company, DBS? Um, so we're very digital focused. We uh, uh, were awarded world's best digital bank, but to us, that's really kind of meaningless. The real thing I want you to take away is that we are at war. And as my boss keeps reminding me, digital and technology is the way we're going to win or lose. Yorgos. So Kayago started uh, back in 2004 to make travel search easier. Uh, what uh, many users don't see is that there is a lot of machine learning behind the scenes. There has been a lot of machine learning behind the scenes for years. 
which helps us provide the right results to the user at the right time. So you're, you're completely comfortable with the machine learning conversation? I did a PhD at MIT. In it. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Race ipsa loquitur, Ms. Stoddard. So, um, so uh, I work for Adobe, and uh, what I'd like you to take away about Adobe is, you know, we are actually a 35-year-old company, a creative company, and we exist to empower the creatives, but also to improve the experiences of, you know, of people, of customers. Very good. We'll talk, though, about the creative cloud and the analytics yes. and marketing cloud, because yeah. there's an interesting convergence opportunity yeah. here. Yeah. The second yeah. question is, what prompted your organization with the declaration of war? It's going to be very clear for what Mr. Glettel's answer is going to be, but what prompted your organization to step up and take AI as you define it, so feel free to give us a bit of ontology there, seriously as a business capability, as a business technology? Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to dare even to try and define <laughs> AI because that gets you into all sorts of uh, nasty fly traps. But uh, you know, basically, our objective is to uh, scale exponentially in markets that we don't exist in. And we believe AI is the only way that we'll be able to do that um, with, a, with a sensible footprint of people and, and, uh, and branches. En enabling exponential scaling. Yorgos, you're, of, you're already exponentially scaled. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it's a measurable improvement in user experience. And uh, when uh, you personalize better your results, when you remove more of, uh, of fair inaccuracies, uh, you can see the impact on the user experience. Excellent. Ms. Stoddard? So we've always had AI in our products. We've referred to it as the Adobe Magic. And what we've, you know. That's a good brand for AI, Magic, <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, what we want to be able to do with it is really unleash the power and let our customers have access to it so that we can, you know, remove the mundane and let people focus on the creativity. Very good. And, and the last question in the sequence is, as you look at implementation, not conceptualization, implementation of this. What's been your most pleasant or and your most unpleasant surprise in the implementation process? Um, so I think pleasant is that um, uh, much of it is not actually that hard. Uh, I think it gets this aura of complexity, but it's actually quite easy. Um, the, the, the challenge is that once people uh, do a little bit of it, uh, they get wild expectations of what it is and can do. Uh, and so the whole plot starts to unravel and containing them to a sensible set of outcomes is very difficult. So what you're saying is it doesn't exponentially scale well. Well, it, <laughs> it's not so much that. It, 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 scales, it scales up, but not out. Ah, very good. Yorgos, <laughs> you're smiling. Uh, so the pleasant uh, surprise was the way users engage with it. For example, the flight fare uh, pr uh, price prediction. Um, uh, users appreciate that it's statistically, uh, it's a statistical measurement, sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's wrong. When we don't provide it because we don't have enough data, they ask for it. Where is it? Why don't I, I see one? Um, unpleasant, well, uh, we, we've invested a lot, a lot in voice, uh, and uh, it's interesting to see a, a user engagement for fly status, but nobody is buying um, uh, much travel yet. Very, very so. good, very good. So you have to get a sponsor for that. <laughs> So I would say the pleasant surprise is the opportunities are endless. You can apply AI to many different problems. Um, the unpleasant or, you know, is, would really be uh, what I would say the talent, making sure that you have the right talent and you're preparing talent to operate in that world. I want to use that talent answer and connect it to some of the things that we talked about in anticipation of this and what Mr. Gladhill said on stage this morning. Has, and Yorgos also made a particular comment as we were, as we were, uh, setting up this thing. Does this, to what extent does AI slash machine learning, however we want to define it, represent a continuation of existing development, implementation, agile culture versus, oh my gosh, we have to revisit the fundamentals again and we do need yet another cultural revolution to make this exponentially scale to enable that measurable, high-impact customer experience. I'll start with you, Jorgos, on this. Yeah, uh, for us, it's a, it's a continuation. It's, uh, to me, there is nothing magic about it. It's uh, just uh, computational statistics with more computational But you, you got your PhD at MIT, so it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not magic. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the mean question is, but do you, do, right. yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but do you have to hire people like you to make it work? 
Um, you, <laughs> you can, it definitely helps. You can obviously t train people, but yeah, you are in Cambridge, you hire people like me. Yeah, I think, you, I, I think you have to hire people with the right level of curiosity that want to explore. So it could be people, you know, with PhD, you know, from MIT, but there are other people who want to explore also too. Um, I agree that it's not starting over, but it's definitely a different mindset where you know, people are used to solving problems in one way, and you need to give them the opportunity to explore and try different things out, because if you go down the normal path, you might be missing some of the opportunity and leaving it behind. How, how would you characterize the AI slash ML culture at Adobe right now? Um, I'm really alive, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, like I said, it's, you know, it's been built into our products for a while. Now that we're exposing it and you know pulling it out, um, I would say that every team wants to have a have a voice. Every team wants to have a part in in injecting that into their product or their process because it's not just within our products that we're using the technology or the ideas. We're also using it you know within the IT environment in order to look at how we run processes. We're looking at it in our finance group. So I would say it's just a really live, a live topic. So, so let me ask the, the question in a mean way. Do the business people have a clue of what's involved, or is it, to use the M word, magic, as far as they're concerned? So I think it's, I mean, I think it's a, you know, a mix. I mean, we have 17,000 right. people, right, that work at Adobe. I would say that um, a lot of people understand what the potential is. Would they understand how to approach it and how to do it and how to write algorithms? No, no, absolutely not. David, um, so it's we see it's just another tool in the in the toolbox. So you know, we as a company uh, design and engineer process that delivers products to customers, uh, and now we just have another tool in the toolkit we can apply to that. Mm -hmm. But what you what you have to do then is train people to understand what the tool is and can and cannot cannot do, uh, and and maybe redesign for, for it. So, you know, we used to, uh, back in the day, you know, design for efficient ops. Um, and we, that ultimately was kind of stupid because you don't want any ops. So we crossed right. out the ops <laughs> and, and we put a little, little arrow that said design for no ops, which is how you take ops out of the, the process. And now did, we started- By the way, did people laugh or did they take that seriously? No, that did they understand great. that? Yeah, I mean, they to totally got it. I mean, that penny drop changed the way we thought about process in the organization. Just one little up arrow no. Um, and, and now we're saying, oh, that, that worked, so how about you know, design for AI? Uh, and what does design for AI mean? Um, and it means a whole load of things around data capture, data governance, instrumentation, uh, and also the way you design the process of what is applicable to, to AI. So and that training people to understand what that actually means uh, is, the, is the kind of challenge and opportunity. I, I want to get to the training challenge, but I want to follow up again, just to create the illusion of continuity from your comments this morning. Um, <laughs> You talked about the importance of KPIs, yeah. mm. you know, holding people accountable, being explicit about what performance means and what key performance means and how we measure it. Yeah. What's the KPI? What are the two KPIs you're using to train, to educate, to hold people accountable for this new tool in the toolbox? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. It's evolving because we don't want to go too far too soon because we think that's just going to alienate people uh, completely. So th this year, the KPIs are more around training education awareness. You know, we want to train the top 250 executives in the firm that they're AI conversant. Uh, we want to train 200 people uh, to be what we call AI translators. In other words, they can understand a business problem, understand the capabilities. When, when you say conversant, do you mean understanding the difference between supervised and unsupervised and reinforcement learning or being able to do alternating least squares gradient descent? Yeah, no, so the, the former. Okay. Uh, but also be able to intelligently uh, question what a model is and can do. There's a lot of uh, hype around oh, this model can predict this or do that, and people don't understand that, okay, what 10 questions do you, do you ask to understand really how good that model is and what the outlier cases are and all the rest of that kind of Would stuff. Would they so, understand overfitting? Um, well, ex that's exactly one of the points. Yeah, exactly. So how do you train a business leader to understand and ask the right questions to get to the determination of whether or not it's overfitting or not? 
So, so your Garcia, you're a CTO. Do you have this problem at a kayak or issue with a kayak? Because he has he has a legacy organization. Kayak is kind of born digital. The flip side is mm. I've I've been around long enough. Time. Kayak did like traditional, you know, coding of this. I I think AI really does require different ways of doing data governance and and data ingestion, data processing. Is this a on the margins issue for you, or is it is it as significant as what you've heard David describe? Um, I, I think it's more on the margins. We do run um, training so that more people get exposed to the vocabulary and everything. But uh, we don't run KPIs on, uh, on the usage of machine learning. At the end of the day, it's about measuring user experience. If the machine learning is the right tool, you use it. If it provides improvement, you use it. If not, um, a, a healthy dose of cynicism is, is always. No, that, that, that's very good. So tell us what UX KPIs you use that influence and make people more aware of where of when they are more likely to get value added from traditional coding yeah, versus training against it. Yeah, there's basically one KPI. Have we helped the user find the flight, hotel, or car they were looking okay. for? Did we enable a conversion for our partners? And um, the, whatever tools you use underneath, they have to drive to, uh, towards an improvement for that. And is, are the dimensions predominantly time? Is it, is it a latency sort of thing? Is it a customer satisfaction? Is it a completion of transaction? How granular do you get on this? The dominant metric is uh, completion of transaction. Have the, has the user found what they, they were looking for? And when you see failure modes and incompleteness, what problem in the machine learning or in the data does it tend to be? What pathology do you consistently find as you scale this out to the millions of transactions, tens of millions of transactions you facilitate? Uh, sometimes it's um, uh, un unfamiliarity. If you change the, the user experience way too much, um, uh, uh, the users might be taken aback. and It takes time to, to retrain them. For example, uh, we recently... <laughs> so training the users is yeah, as important yeah. as training the data sets. No, well, for example, recently we, uh, <coughs> we implemented a, a, a machine learning algorithm for sorting flights instead of just sorting by, by price. Mm -hmm. ah. and, and it was sorted by likelihood of transaction, but some users, the, the snackers we call them, the ones who just ran a search to see what the current price is, were taken aback that they didn't see the cheapest price on top. Right. Mm. So yeah. now it's a hybrid. You still put the right. cheapest price on top, and then you saw by likelihood of conversion, so um, it works for the user for now. So you have this kind of issue at Adobe because you have a dual constituency between people who want to do the marketing cloud for analytics and the creative cloud for creative and yep. intersecting these yeah, things. Yeah. And so also, yeah, and also I, I would imagine that. that one of the challenges that you have mm -hmm. is when does it make sense for us to use machine learning to optimize a particular task or function versus the interaction ensembles mm -hmm. of tasks and functions? That's true, and actually we do we do both. Um, we optimize we optimize both because um, you know our view of the world with AI from a product perspective. If you think about Creative Cloud, is more like a Harry Potter view of the world where. Um, we want to do good things um, and help people do their tasks quicker. So if you think about the work that is done within Harry Potter, we will, or within Creative Cloud, we'll look at, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll look at you know, the different activities and you know, if you're doing a lot of things repetitively, how can we help you do that? Um, but to your other point about the, you know, the uh, experience, we actually do similar in um, tracking the customer experience across so, you know, are you hung up on a particular product feature? You know, are you spending too much time trying to figure out, you know, something, you know, get through the, you know, sign up for a product or whatever? Or do you even know which product is the best one to use? And then we apply, you know, analytics and AI to that to make that journey go smoother. So there's a very interesting thing that I'm inferring from, from the, the quasi overlap and consensus in your answers that you, uh, you, you don't really look at AI slash ML, because I'm from the rules-based era, not the data-based era, for, for process, not funny, trust me, process efficiencies. Uh, um, you what, really what look, you yeah, for process, process efficiencies. You really, look yeah. at, you really don't look at it from the vantage of process efficiencies. You look at it from the vantage of process efficiencies as they relate to user experience. Yeah. No. 
Ah. No. Well, I would say well, flawed. Nice try. Flawed. It was a flawed <laughs> inference. It was a flawed inference. But at least I'm not overfitting. Yeah, go, go, yeah. So yeah. what? So, what is it for you? So, um, some cases. okay. Uh, and, and this is really our evolution because I think, I think the process is the big thing that it, it solves so, and the scale is a big thing for it solves so. So um, I, I describe. You know, phase one this year is embed embed knowledge and get a broad set of people, uh, AI conversant at least, with the basic questions to ask. Um, but we're working on what does phase two metrics look like, and that's where we, how do you solve process at scale? So, you know, for example, on current employee base, um, should a KPI be, you know, how do we take out the first uh, thousand employees with AI? Or, you know, think about an AI as an employee. Uh, God, I hope that isn't the first question you ask, but yes. Yeah, employ your first thousand AI people, right? And then the second one is around scale, and it's saying, you know, how can we leverage AI uh, to scale a thousand times in markets. Because I, I think when you start to go kind of three orders of magnitude up, you really start to get the imagination going about uh, the art of the possible, because the only way you can do that is with some sort of AI. And the, the third one is around the, this sort of process and sort of this uh, concept of kind of watching. Uh, and you know, a goal one of our teams has already set there is, how do I detect a, thousand, uh, a million problems before they happen? For me, it's all about user experience. <laughs> Uh, what advice would you offer? Um, do, you think, do you think he's being too process oriented on this? Um, but maybe uh, it's a bank. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a <laughs> oh, like, it's a bank. Oh my God, it's there's, a bank. Uh, there's like, blood the on, guys, ladies huh? and gentlemen, yeah, there's blood on the floor. Oh. <laughs> Nasty bankers. <laughs> So you're, you're, you're stand for, more serious because it, it's not as if fintech and customer touches are relevant uh, to DBS's very good NPS scores and brands. <laughs> yes, so what, yes, what, yes. what advice do you have on, on that? I think you fo for us, you focus on the output rather than uh, intermediate uh, uh, metrics, uh, and then you optimize whatever is, you improve whatever is necessary. Well, sm quick point on NPS. Yeah. We've, um, we, that's another area where I'm a bit cynical. Uh, so we found that, for example, through experimentation, that the fa best way to improve your NPS <coughs> score is just move the questionnaire in a different part of the page. So mm -hmm. oh. count us in the cynical. Wow. wow. That's very Everybody good. Can I come back on that Please. customer? Because <laughs> of what you called out banks. It's like, but uh, I'll put that comment aside. But the, the customer experience, yeah. I, I, that is <coughs> important. So this solve a, thousand, uh, a million issues before they happen is around customer experience. Uh, and w we think that um, as we evolve our product set, this, so we've, we've kind of gone along this journey of customer experience from customer feedback, which just simply doesn't, doesn't work that well, mm. to um, you know, design uh, thinking, um, to what we're now exploring is this whole, whole arena of customer science. Uh, in, in other words, so what is, what is science applied to customers and customer behaviors, and uh, how, all the things you talk about, where are the friction points and the touch points, and what is great service look like, and you know, where are customers uh, uh, struggling? And so our, we, we said design for no ops was our thing, and we crossed that out right. in AI, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, design for customer ops is kind of the new thinking we've, we've got. Ah. And what, is, what, is, what, what would a customer operations look like? And what would a dashboard look like? And what are the instrumentation points that you would look like? Uh, and already, for example, we're starting to say, you know, for example, um, what, what type of a response time on our website would turn a customer away from going to the next right. transaction? And what does great look like? And how do you engineer great? Uh, and, and frankly, how can you use AI and ML in, the, in, that in your data centers and all those other things to engineer for greatness and outlier detection? And so you're alerting on this whole customer science dashboard so you're ahead of the customer and solving a million problems before they happen. So that's a critical aspect of this whole journey. I, I, I couldn't agree more, but this seems to play directly into the kind of issues you're confronting with, with uh, Adobe, with the marketing cloud and the... Yeah, that's absolutely. Asking the other side. So what's your, how, how do you strike this balance between... So, uh, yeah, so how I strike the balance is I look at it from kind of the outside in and then the inside out. Right. On the outside in, it's all about the customer experience. Right. And using, you want to right? clarify, outside in, it's designed from the customer in... Right, a customer in perspective. And right. that's all about the experience and looking at their journey points and ensuring that we move them along and we remove all the friction points. From the inside out, or from the organization out point of view, it's all about, okay, how do we design for scale? How do we look at efficiency? So how do we take time out of the process? So looking at our operational, you know, our IT operations and saying, how do we recover, you know, When they down. conflict, what do you do? 
I just want to get a sense of the Adobe values on this. So when they conflict, the yeah, customer when they comes conflict. first. You sure? Yeah, Is I'm there sure. a KPI for that? Is there a KPI for that? Do you track that? those conflicts? Not, not specifically. So I'm trying the, to think how the, we would track the conflict a conflict. Of customer satisfaction yeah. versus? Versus if process efficiency. Oh. So okay. if um, we would prioritize customer over internal, but I mean, we don't have you know, KPIs that look at areas of conflict. So the, one of the reasons right. why I'm asking this is one of the things I've seen a lot of organizations attempt to do with their processes that matter, and I'm yeah. looking at you, Yorgos, on this, is they use, they understand their, that because they're streaming the data, they can begin to do predictive analytics. We are likely to have these kinds of latencies given this kind yep. of demand, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. How are we using ML in, in, in that regard? Because that would be one way to obviate certain kinds of tensions. Do you, when, when one looks at the way you've invested in implementation, how much of that is prophylactic yep. as opposed to efficiency? Mm. Yeah, uh, so uh, th there is a lot of that, in fact, and because... Uh, Give us examples. Uh, um, bot detection. <laughs> Fraud detection, that's a good example, okay. Uh, uh, our, our own uh, suppliers of uh, information, airlines, uh, the online travel agencies, et cetera, love our data, so some of them actually hire bot scrapers to find out uh -huh. their competitors' prices. So, but, um, so protecting the website from uh, malicious or non-malicious bots is very important because it, it, it interferes with the user experience. Right. Um, also for latency. Uh, Forecasting intelligently uh, what are the next few queries that you might get allows you to preemptively cache them and uh, right. provide the result to the user very quickly. Or um, that's a nice twist on the no ops <laughs> point there. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes uh, you you make the user wait for 60 seconds because they are going to find the cheapest fare from a very very slow European online travel agency. But sometimes that wait is not worth it because you know they're not going to find it of in cheapness. So. So you protect the user from that latency. So there is all that, uh, but in the end, I, I, it still affects user experience in the end. That's so how, how we're looking at it, uh, and this is evolving within the company, is to, um, and I talked this morning around these concepts of a, of a platform that, are, that both tech and ops have joint KPIs around a platform. And one of those is how do you, uh, how do you gauge and manage compute, uh, uh, con uh, customer experience on that? And at what point do you call new feature versus fixing uh, right. customer experience, right? right. Uh, and we've, mm -hmm. we have this concept which we stole uh, from Google actually, uh, and a great book to read on this whole question is Google SRE, mm -hmm. uh, Site Reliability Engineering, which goes into all sorts of concepts around this. But anyway, they have this concept of error budget, right? So every time yes. a customer hits a performance degradation or a struggle, uh, it, it counts against the platform. And you know, you're allowed- That's, to a, K that's a KPI. That's a KPI, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're allowed to do that because you want to, you want to move fast. Right. But if that, if that number starts to ratchet up to a certain number, then they have to stop. And they have to refocus effort on solving those customer pain points interaction. It can be performance, it can be struggle, it can be I didn't complete a transaction, whatever it is. And so that you can round everything up into a single number. Uh, and what's your error budget for the platform, uh, and what's your toll gate which you stop and then fix? Quick show of hands, how many of you have organizations that explicitly have an error budget analogous? analogous? Okay, well I think that's a constructive, useful takeaway on, on, on this. And I wanna connect that to a, a question that we just got here, which is, it says, talk about the implications of poor data on, mm. on AI. We can, poor has multiple uh, uh, ways of interpreting it, integrity, reliability, latency. The, the, the way I would like you to address that question is, can you talk about data quality in the context of data governance in your organizations? Peter Weil, who spoke earlier, did a wonderful book on IT governance, and I sort of wonder to what extent those really constructive insights on IT governance have been superseded by the challenges of data governance because it's the quality of data that determine exactly the kind of predictive analytics and these error budgets that we've been, we've been talking about. So you know, data governance is a really tough one. Um, I think a lot of organizations struggle with it. What we've done is um, we haven't tried to do this you know, huge data governance effort. What we've tried to do is actually have a distributed network of data stewards uh, we come up with... Data stewards. Yes. How, how, how many, basically? 
How many? Um, there's probably over a hundred wow. or more. Yeah, yeah, because it's all distributed, right? And but we have come up with a method of having common definition, consistency of business metrics. You, you have know, an right ontology level. committee, basically. Uh, it's not a committee. I wouldn't okay. say it's a Sorry. group that well. <laughs> Uh, because it isn't a group that comes together, it's really a virtual team. Okay. And we've been able to manage it in a virtual environment. How tightly coupled are they with the AI initiatives, ML initiatives that you They're have? very tightly coupled, very tightly coupled, because as you know, the data moves through and we you know, bring it into our platforms, which we have, then you know, it has to be defined, it has to have that common definition. So in order to be a, you know, some data that is recognized, it has to be uh, governed through, the, uh, through this virtual network. So we have MIT PhDs, so we don't have to worry about the data governance issue at Kayak? No, we do. It's a, uh, data quality matters both as a, re it's also a real-time problem because you may have a, a supplier that give, right. uh, has issues on their end, and, right. mm. and sometimes it has happened, we got minus one cents uh, as flight prices. And that throws, if, if you don't plan for it, you get uh, predictions that are thrown off. Are you more driven by data governance or data quality? Because more of than the real data, more by data quality. And the, so more, both on re, uh, from a real time perspective, but also from experiment evaluation. Ah. Uh, you want to protect yourself from um, uh, make, making the wrong decisions based on outliers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, defensive uh, treatment of data quality helps. Good. You have compliance issues, of course, so yeah. there's a certain uh, a regulatory framework for it, but you're managing a transformi transformation. One of the questions we heard was what happens when you're way ahead of your regulators. So what kind of insights do you have on that? Yeah. What, is, so that, is, that a, is that a an accelerator or a break? For um, you? So we, we think it's an accelerator. We think right now it's a break because people are, are too worried about who to give access to what. So uh, part of our this year KPIs, you know, one is on training, another one is uh, uh, speed, but also um, uh, tagging and governance of, of elements of data. So how, many, how much data do we have that has a proper governance framework around it mm. and has the right access rights and controls around it? On the, on the flip side of that is how fast can we get and solve requests for data? Uh, and that's measured wow. from you know, days to hours sort of thing. So it, it, there's two sides of this. It, we think if we get the governance right and the automation. Who owns governance? Uh, so a central team f in my group do. So we have a, we have a team uh, uh, around data first and they're driving culture, they're driving this governance question, and also driving the capability. So we think there's kind of three big, uh, three big throng, uh, prongs to get this done. Um, so we think better governance increases speed to market, uh, is really what we think, if we can get it right. Uh, because it's pre-tagged, it's pre-allocated, you have types of jobs, types of jobs have access to roles. Now, but that's gotta be defined at the data layer, because typically in our systems, we define access by function. And, wow. and so, you know, we're, we're trying to- so, so much for collaboration. Yeah, yeah, because it is. You know, I, I'm a, I, you know, I can go into this system and I can, you know, add, add a transaction, but that doesn't tell you anything about the data governance and who can have access to the data. So you've got to take that access grid and sort of flip it 90 degrees. One of the questions we're trying to a ask ourselves is, can we use the same model for, you know, functional access versus uh, data access? Um, not sure if we can solve that yet, but if we get that right, that'll speed up uh, access speed this to market. This strikes me as the kind of issue you're dealing with. Yeah, it is. It's exactly the same issue because we've had to flip it, and uh, we've approached it by you know subject area, and as we bring subject areas into the recognized you know data warehouse and that, it's all sanctioned. So we the flip does actually work. Yeah, it yeah, does yeah. work. So um, I have an irritated question. An irritated. Are, are, are not not irritating. Irritated. Are we lumping advanced statistical analytics and modeling and algorithms into the definition of AI, you know, which is the fly <laughs> trap on, on, on this? You know, my, my cheap heuristic, it's, it's a system that learns from, from data without human intervention. But do, do you think we're, we're falsely aggregating all of these things? Or is that false aggregation, the real truth of what AI and ML is going to look like? Yeah, I, I think we are, so I didn't attempt the definition because it, it's a very blurry line. I, I, I have, um, you know, I, I was kind of musing about this to myself and, you know, just the same way we have the, the Turing test, um, I, I have this kind of car park barrier test to AI. Uh, it is, is a car park barrier AI because it's a machine 
operating autonomously in its environment without human interaction. Car goes up, barrier goes up. Uh, is it AI? Well, no, not really. Well, what if it was a camera it's, recognizing? It's rule-based AI. It's rule-based. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so but, but who cares if it's AI or not? It doesn't exactly. really matter, right? So I, I think, you know, rather than dig into the philosophy of what's, um, you know, statistical analysis, rule-based, um, you know, ML, matrix multiplication, right. deep learning, who, who cares, right? There's a continuum. And, you know, moving around that continuum is what, is what we care about. Uh, you know, we'll leave it to the philosophers to discover what intelligence yeah. is and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I know I've got a set of tools, I know I've got a set of algorithms, and I can apply to problems and create solutions. That's mm -hmm. all Some of them happen to be called AI and ML. Don't care. Good, good fit. Yeah. Is that your attitude as well, Jorgos? Yeah, who cares if it works? Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who cares? Men's it, 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 it Who cares if it works? So, so... You can also apply the test, though. Would you apply... AI to a car park barrier, because right. you know it's a, you know to make sure it's not a solution looking for a problem. Right. Yeah. That's, but but if it, I want to deal with the if it works. You know, we've had a couple of questions on unconscious bias, and I, you know, I used to be a skeptic on unconscious bias, and then I looked at the data that things were being trained on, and then I was a convert because it was clear that the, those data sets had baked in bias. Uh, how do you do? quality, the, the data has good quality, but it doesn't match your expectations of, you know, your supervised learning. We, we thought it would optimize in this, it, and it doesn't. H how do you deal with, and maybe this is a little too granular, but how do you deal with these circumstances where you've sold an implementation because it facilitates scaling, it facilitates, you know, your example is a great one. Uh, flight routes versus mm -hmm. price as the design and organizing principle, or people who want to make their analytics more creative and create, you know, inform their creativity with analytics. What do you do when it's training and the model just basically underperforms expectations and certainly underperforms the amount of resources and effort you put into it? Fast fade, crash yeah. it and move on. Yeah. Trash it and move on. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, so yeah. but, but I think understanding the Why? right questions to ask to know yeah. that you have to trash it is is key. I, yeah, I, Yoga, I'm going to focus on you because your answer that was an that's an irritating answer to me because that's that's you've got a C in your title and maybe it's easy for you to write down fail fail fast, but there are teams that have invested dozens scores and hours on these. There's been a lot of money spent. You know, what are the boundaries of failure? How will we come to understand failure of ML and AI implementations versus, say, an ERP or a supply chain solution, traditional box kind of thing, or a cloud kind of software as a service? What, what are your different hyperparameters for failure as you do machine learning implementations? I have the luxury of uh, a few million users per day uh, voting with their clicks, so I, I, uh, we either help them or not, and then we. So, but so what you're saying is you're happy to do an experiment, yeah. And so long as you can justify to Steve, the the CEO and management and the board, that net net the experiments are enabling you to learn more than costing money, you're good. Is that an over? Well, I think you should. Yeah, I mean, um, no, we, we are a bit more federated than that. We don't need to justify it. So we encourage uh, our engineers, any engineer can run any experiment. Wow. Uh, so How many uh, do? Not everybody. Maybe I would say 20%, the ones who feel comfortable. What's the most interesting machine learning experiment going on in Kayak right now? I, it's still about uh, a, a flight sort of. A flight, flight, or sort, flight. Yeah, yeah. Trying to make that work. Yeah. So it's the damn customers getting in the way. On, on no, that, I mean, customers uh, teach us. Okay. I mean, it's never the dumb customers. We are dumb for doing it wrong. <laughs> What's the most interesting machine learning initiative, AI learning initiative that you would describe? To, if the board said, what are we doing uh, uh, that's machine learning AI unambiguously, you know, discrete as opposed to the co continuum you've described? Um, What's uh, the most interesting thing? AI based ideas? lending. AI based lending. Hmm. So taking the human out of the loop. Yeah. yeah. Which, how, which vertical, how vertical is it? You do the credit and give us the. Yeah, so basically from the um, point of customer applying for a, for a loan, the whole thing takes place automatically and autonomously. That's what we're trying to get How long has that been going on? Uh, we've been on it about a year. We launched actually the product um, end of last year, and we're still sort of in, in a test and learn phase. But, and it's basically using 
um, a whole load of kind of social uh, data as well uh, and behavioral data to do the scoring. So it kind of looks at social interactions and, and things like that. In actual fact, we, we kind of, you know, this is kind of where question of appropriateness and stuff, we haven't got onto that, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, it, we, we, we actually have a, we actually have what we call a creepy committee, which actually looks at that, that whole thing. We, we call it. I, I have a digital, David. I have an ethics question here, <laughs> yeah. so feel free to okay, go no, right but, into that. Okay, we'll, we'll go there later. But um, so, you know, we, we were sort of using, uh, you know, third party and we created this app that scrapes a whole load of uh, information uh, uh, from the, the phone right. about behavior, right? And you authorize that and stuff. And, um, you know, and we pushed this out into the Play Store and tested it on the Play Store and Google first. Anyway, Google shut us down because they felt we were being inappropriate about the use and access of personal information. So for Google to shut a bank down, we were actually, that was, that was quite so a proud moment, your, right? Do you like, approve or, do you, do you, do you like, like or dislike that? Like, the, yeah, the, we've, the we've bad made boys it. of banking <laughs> here. You know. no, uh, no, I approve. I think that is, uh, lending uh, can be, uh, there is a lot of innovation to be had there uh, about smarter uh, decision making. And I'm surprised Google will consider something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's a good passive aggressive answer. What's the most interesting machine <laughs> for for Adobe? I mean, there there's so many ways that you could do. It. I mean, you have the analytics capability, of the marketing capability, of the the creative cloud capability. What what are the the, the uh, are they managed by division or group, or is there sort of an overarching way? Well, of there, there's at this? a there's an overarching you know framework strategy that we call um, Sensei. So we do have an overarching sensei team. I think the, um, uh, what I would say the, the most uh, exciting is what we're doing in the creative space and creative cloud to help those creatives, you know, do their work, um, find things, you know, with search and then put it all together, um, you know, to create new, new objects. Are you going to be sponsoring, I mean, there's a lot going on machine learning, I've, uh, you know, a, a variety of different ways of training different, different styles, et cetera. Is, is, is this an, I, do we see, as we've seen with DBS, do we see a blurring between IT and digital and product in this regard? Because you're, you have a cloud that manages a cloud and, and it, how, how does the investment that you make internally for machine learning and AI transform the way customers get to get value from tools, get value from the way you let them ensemble things? So the in, the internal invest well th there's um, yeah so the internal investments you know will improve their experience uh, from um, from different you know different aspects you know one would be you know the tools that they use on their you know when they are actually creating and then as they actually access our websites and <coughs> and do things you know some of the other internal operational to get to the to no ops type uh, approach, the experience, the responsiveness uh, as they go through their journey would be less painful. Does Adobe have a customer experience person? Oh, we have, yes, we have a customer experience person mm -hmm. and we have a customer experience team. And what is their relationship to your group? Um, we work very closely are together. They, are they partners? Oh, absolutely, partners. Who, who, and, and, and they get to win because they represent the customers. Uh, they, yeah, they do, they do. We work very closely together. We're looking at different, um, you know, automation, the experience, uh, how we inject, you know, bots into their processes, you know, what the, you know, where we can, you know, take friction out of their communication with the customer and things like that. Not just um, on the website, but on all the different surfaces that a customer could talk to Adobe on. Yorgos, what about for Kayak? It's, it's, it's seamless between product yeah, and user experience? Yeah, user experience reports to product, that reports to me. So it, it's a very integrated team, but we also run squads. Uh, so we what, have- I'm sorry, you run? What is called squ squads. Uh, so basically, let's, the, the flight squad is gonna have a dedicated UX person that really is designing okay. the product manager. So they're all embedded and work together. What portion of your squads have what you would characterize as machine learning slash AI capabilities? Everybody does. Yeah. Everybody does. Yeah. What about for you, David? Uh, yeah, no, so uh, only a few. I mean, we, same thing, we have big uh, CX and you know, the, the magic you know, where- Do you own c customer experience? Uh, so I own the transformation of the company to think about customer experience as a, as a, as a product that, and an outcome. That sounds, you, now you sound like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, 
so all of these things that we do, all the trans be it AI, be it innovation, be it customer experience or whatever, um, we make the business own accountability for it. Um, but you need to help them to learn how to do it and provide tool sets and training and things like that. So what we have as a central group is people that apply skill set uh, and capability. Uh, the business own it and they want to consume it. And, and, and really, we're kickstarting. It's like a fire lighter. So once it's up and running within a business, we do less and less and less. So I'm going to ask one question, but I, w I would like the Slido poll to be put up because I want to ask you to participate because I want the last few minutes to be mm -hmm. focused on specific poll from the audience. What two words, and I want you to enter these words separately, what two words best describe your AI implementation, however your organization defines implementation, AI implementation efforts at this time? And we're going to create a word cloud on that. And so the question I want to ask you while you're doing that on your Slido, slow, that, that's, that's a good. So I, I was worried that it described the poll itself. Uh, um, so so, so the, 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 the question, the follow-up question on, on for, for your situation is, is to what extent do you feel that um, you have to fight to get these things done mm -hmm. versus there's a rough enough consensus that, that you know, the, we're, we're, we're arguing over the details as opposed to the main thrust? Yeah, no, I think we're done on main thrust. Then it's the, it's the how and executing, uh, executing. So, you know, large portion of the senior exec team understands it, believes in it, thinks we can get scale from it. The question is then how we how we execute quickly what, and fast. Uh, it's still going, we'll let it go on for a couple of moments. And, and as quick question, quick answer for each yeah. of you, and then we'll turn to this and we'll end on that. What's the most important fight going on at, at, about AI and machine learning implementation at, at DBS? Fight. The most um, important fight. Uh, it's uh, speed. Fighting? Speed. How we get speed. Yeah. Jeez, and uh. notice, he either has eyes in the back <laughs> of his head or... <laughs> What's, what's the big fight at Kayak? There is no fight. There is no fight. Yeah. <laughs> yes. my, my suggestion is don't disagree with Yorgos in a, in a, yeah, no. in a meeting at Kayak. What about yeah, for you? Yeah, I, I, we were just talking. We don't, ha we don't have any fights either. Yeah. So, so basically this whole notion of creative tension, pun intended, is, is irrelevant to you guys. Well, you know, there's always tension, but I can't think of anything we're actually fighting yeah. about. I can't yeah. think of anything. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Creative tension is, uh, yeah. is very healthy. You, you, you want uh, your engineers and product people to compete for you're the best Greek. ideas. Creative tension and fight are synonymous. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. said you want your, your people to compete for the best idea. Excellent. So let's turn around and look at the key, key words here. The one in the Whoa. center is hype. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, by the way, I am personally and professionally insulted by that because really? everything you've hey. heard from the panel is the antithesis yeah. of hype. But then again, it's describing your efforts in this regard. So ethically confused, <laughs> hype, <laughs> hype, <laughs> ethically challenged, ethically confused, experimenting optimistic research and development, woefully deficient, non-existent learning hype, exper hype. and experiment. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Rick. wow. So let's, let's do one last loop before we end and say, what's the most important, based on this interaction, what's the most important thing you want this audience to understand about what they should do next to deal with the hype issue, the slow issue, the focus issue? What do they really need to prioritize? Because clearly, we have two people, that you, you, they're not, there's not a fight, there's a consensus here and that it's moving the needle and that it matters. This is reality for you. And it's a huge enabler for DBS. So what do people need to know? Yeah, I think, first of all, you've got to get, what's the bold ambition? What do you, what do you think you can really get out of it? For us, it's scaling 1,000 times in markets we're getting into uh, as a first stepping stone. Um, I think that, then, secondly, you need to really kind of get this kind of governance in question and, and the training and awareness, which solves a lot of the hype. You know, a lot of the stuff we're doing on CEDA leadership training is to solve for hype. Um, uh, and then speed to market and agility, which comes around all of the data claims in the pipeline and the infrastructure. So, you know, what's the, what's the mission? Get the people trained, solve for hype, build the pipes. Very good. Yogas? For me, as I said, it's a focus on the output. Uh, provide the- The output being customer user yeah. experience. Yeah. It's all reverse engineered, all done to support user experience. Yes. Your organ and so you've been at the company how many years now? Almost 20, 10. 20, yeah. 
it, it's been internalized. User experience is the KPI for you, and everything supports that. Yes. Sir. That's a so I would say pick a problem and let a team just solve it. Give them the time and give them the resources. The reason why I'm unhappy with that answer is that's a pilot issue, not an implementation issue. Uh, what do people not need Not necessarily, not okay. necessarily. I mean, you can say, solve this problem for me. I mean, I've done it within Adobe, is solve this problem for me. It wasn't a pilot. It was, okay, we're gonna figure out how to do it. And it goes right into production and the results were remarkable. It's all about giving people the amount of time to think and letting them know that you know it's okay if they run into bumps along the way and they solve it themselves, but you know out the other end you'll be remarkable or it's a remarkable what comes out. To me, you know, it's not a pilot. It's take a real problem and take a team together, bring it together, and solve it. You get the last word, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank our panelists. I thought you guys were terrific. Thank you so much.